and we're so tired of the voices in our heads and the voices in our culture. We long to hear the voice of God. Generations come and generations go, but the word of the Lord stands forever. About uh, a year ago, I preached a sermon <clears throat> and quoted a lot of bands from the 70s, 80s, and today. And afterwards, my dear shepherd, Brother John Smith, said, Nathan, when are you going to quote Oreo Speedwagon? <laughs> and then, a few weeks ago, Brian Adams made an appearance in a Sunday night lesson. And Brother John said, REO Speedwagon. And then our brother Cy quoted Leonard Cohen. I'm sorry, Brother John. No REO Speedwagon. But I love you. I love you. And I don't want to stop. I just want to keep on <laughs> loving you. <laughs> the year was 1502. Christopher Columbus, who had sailed the ocean blue, was now stranded in the Bahamas. He had no provisions. They were all gone. And his boat was on the shore because of some hole-making worms. And so he had to get help from the indigenous peoples, and he did for a while. And then after a while, they got tired of that, and they told him to take a hike. And he had an idea. He had brought an almanac with him, and he was able to look up and realize that there was going to be a total lunar eclipse. And so he said to the indigenous peoples, if you don't give me the provisions that I need, my God will make the moon turn red. And wouldn't you know it, a few weeks later, that moon turned red, and he had more provisions than he could handle. And I know that tomorrow many of us are going to be staring up into the sky and we're going to be looking at what's going on in the skies. And things have changed. The ancient Chinese thought it was a dragon eating the sun. And there were other people who thought it was an omen, a portent from the gods. And they would, for example, if they had a king, they would appoint a king for a day who got to enjoy being king for a day only to be sacrificed at the end of the day as a way of saying, we'll give you our king, but save our real king. And there's some really interesting stories of what's happened during total eclipses. I think for most of us, we're excited to see something very rare. The next time this is going to happen is in 2044, but you'll have to catch a flight to Montana to see it. Right here in our own backyard, we get to see something that, for most of us, isn't an omen or a sign in the sky. It's simply a revelation of the beauty of nature, what God has already placed into the world, and we get to experience something new. And I wonder, I wonder where your mind's going to go when you look up tomorrow. I know where mine will go. I think for those four minutes when everything turns dark and I hear that even the birds may hush their singing... I'll think about those astrologers who years ago saw something in the sky and they came to where the young baby was and they said, we've seen his star in the east and we've, we've come to worship him. And I'll, I'll think about those three hours on an arid day in Jerusalem when everything turned black as Christ gave up his own life for me. I'll stare at that circle and I will think about that dark, empty tomb. I'll think about that stone that was rolled away and the empty tomb that could not hold the King of Kings. And I know that I'll stand there gazing and just think about the apostles who stood there gazing into the sky when the angels said, why are you doing this? Don't you know that he who had to go on up that way, he's going to come back down the same way. No, I, I don't think that the total eclipse is a portent in the sky. But I do think that our God speaks to us. And the question is, will we listen? When our God 
tries to communicate something to us, are we willing to hear, and maybe even more than hear, are we willing to respond? I have a good friend who teaches, uh, taught for years out in Texas, who would begin his classes by drawing a large rectangular box on the chalkboard. And then he would have all the students, and he would say, I want you to pull out a piece of paper, and I want you to draw a long uh, rectangular box. And I want you to put in the box why you're in this class. See, it was a philosophy class, and he said, listen, if you don't know why you're here, in a few weeks we're going to get to Immanuel Kant, and unless you're highly motivated, you're going to hit the exit door. So why are you taking this class? And for years, people turned in answers. And according to him, they always got it wrong. They had answers like, because it's required. Mm, Thank you for playing. Uh, Because my advisor told me I had to. Because I want to graduate. All the years he did this, he said one student put the right answer. One student put the word boat. It's the right answer. You see, he had to take the class so he could graduate. And he had to graduate so he could get the job he wanted. He had to get the job he wanted so he could get the money he wanted so he could buy the boat, which is what he really wanted. Now, there's someone who understood the full point. Why am I in this class? It's so that I can retire on my boat. You know, Stephen Covey, in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, says the second most important habit is that you begin with the end in mind. What is the ultimate goal? I want to ask you. Jesus himself said, what is it that you really, really want? The first words out of his mouth in the Gospel of John. Let me ask you, when you open your Bible, what is the goal of Bible reading? What are you trying to accomplish what are you reading it? What, what's, what's in it for you and what are you in it for? We've been doing a whole series of lessons on how to read the Bible well. And this is our final sermon in the lesson. What is the ultimate goal? There's a lot of answers we could give, a lot of good answers. Because it's required. Because there are rules that I need to follow. No doubt those are true. But even those are means to an end. I think one good answer is that we read Scripture to hear the voice of God. To hear the voice of God. That's a great answer. But another good answer is that we want to hear the voice of God even for something beyond that. We want to hear the voice of God so that we can respond to the voice of God. We see it all through Scripture, don't we? It was Joshua who said, choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And they did. They chose who they're going to serve. In the book of Ezra, Ezra says all the people were gathered together. And they listened to the law and the whole assembly responded with, you are right. We must do as you say. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, says, hear and do, or in the Gospel of John, come and see. Response is needed. It was Peter who preached that sermon, told them to repent and be baptized, and he says, look, save yourselves from this kind of generation that you find yourself in. Do something about it. It was Paul who over and over again said, receive the gospel, confess Jesus Christ, surrender your life to him. And in Revelation, the spirit and the bride, the spirit and the bride say, come and let him who is thirsty come. Let anyone who desires the free water of life come. But not everyone will respond. Proverbs 29 and verse 19 says that there are some people for whom words simply will do no good. The text says, though they understand, they will not respond. 
But then there's the person who wants to hear, the person who is open to God, and God will open such people to him. The story of Lydia. In Acts 16, the text says, she was one of those listening, the text says. One of those listening, a worshiper of God. And God opened her heart, but didn't just open her heart, the NIV puts it, God opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. There's a German theologian in 1934 who was facing a real uphill battle. You know what was going on in Germany in the 30s and early 40s. And he was asked to write a little article. It was only five pages long. The title of which was, How Does God Speak Through the Bible? Five pages where he basically says this, How dare you ask such a question? If you're asking how does he speak through the Bible, you must already believe that he does speak through the Bible. And if you do think that he speaks through the Bible, then ours is not to reason why. Ours is but to do or die. You must respond to the voice that is calling you. Why are we not, says he, simply falling on our faces and saying yes? I want the story of Lydia, to be me. And I want to know what sets apart the servant that will not respond and the one who is so open that God will open their heart. How do I become that kind of person? These are the helpful hints from that German writer. Number one, silence all other voices. There's a lot of voices in our culture clamoring for our attention. I love learning. I love reading. I love listening to new ideas. I can't possibly change and become right when I'm wrong unless I hear something new. I believe in all of that. But even Jesus says in Mark's gospel, be careful not how you hear, be careful what you hear. Because don't you know that all the voices in my head constantly tell me things that aren't true? And all the voices in our culture want to constantly cloud my good judgment and replace all the words of Scripture that have been built up in my mind with the words of self-criticism and self-condemnation, selfishness and pride. Silence all other voices. Turn off every other faucet. Number two, hear the Word of God addressed to you. Now, we made the point that the text was not written to us, but it was preserved for us. The point he's making is that when you hear the message, know that God is speaking. And then he's stepping back and saying, I'm waiting. Don't you know? Don't you know that I had you in mind? that I knew you before you were born, before I formed you in the womb, I knew who you are and what you will be, and I beg you to let me form you. Let me form you into who I want you to be. Third, hear the message over and over again. You think of your favorite song, your favorite song, you know, the one you've only heard one time doesn't work that way. It's the one that your spouse is so sick and tired of hearing. The one that you can't get enough of. John's Ario Speedwagon. You want to hear it over and over and over again until it finally sinks in. Maya Angelou was being uh, interviewed by Oprah. And Oprah said, tell me all about what's going on with you and about your faith. And she said, I still remember. I remember I was a young teenager and I was defiant. And this person was wanting me to read a book. And I opened the book and the first sentence said, God loves me. He says, read it out loud. God loves me. Read it again. God loves me. Read it again. Read it again. Read it again. And she said, it was on the 10th time that I finally realized, wait a second. God loves me. Me, Maya Angelou, that the God who made everything can love me. 
Hear it over and over and over again until you finally realize it's true. And he means it for you. Fourth, hear it ever new. Hear it in ways you've never heard it before so it finally sticks. Hear it from a neighbor. Hear it from your children. Hear it from your spouse. Hear it in a new translation. Hear it in song. Hear it in poetry. Hear it in a sermon. Hear it in prayer. And finally... When you've heard the message over and over again, and you've heard it anew, and you hear his address to you, respond with the readiness of love. Respond with what love requires. Respond as one who wants nothing else but to be with the one our soul loves. Love requires action. You're familiar with James 1. Be ye not hearers of the word only, but doers of the word. But we want to hear it fresh and ever new. So hear it in a a different translation. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you're a listener when you're anything but letting the word go in one ear and out the other. Act on what you hear. Those who hear and don't act are like those who glance in the mirror, walk away, and two minutes later have no idea who they are or what they look like. But whoever catches a glimpse of the revealed counsel of God, the free life, even out of the corner of his eye, and sticks with it, is no distracted scatterbrain, but a man or woman of action. And that person will find delight and affirmation in the action. There's a link between obeying the voice of the Lord and obeying the word that he's given us. The psalmist praises the angels in Psalm 103 and verse 20 as the mighty ones who do his word, comma, obeying the voice of his word. In the small book of Haggai, it's only one page in most Bibles, the text says that all the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And this is what it means to fear the Lord, to hear his voice through the prophets and the apostles. Paul commended the Thessalonians for hearing his message, not as the words of men, but as it was in truth, the very word of God. And so I ask you again, what is the goal of Bible reading? What are we in this for? I mean, we've considered some, some good answers. To hear the voice of God is a good answer. But, but we want to hear the voice of God so we can respond to the voice of God. And even then, we can think of something further down the road. We can respond to the voice of God so that He can take our self-focused, sin-saturated life away from us and to return His own eternal life to us. What if we read the Bible with the goal of being changed from the inside out as our soul cries out? What if we read the Bible to know God and to be known by God, to unleash the power of His Holy Spirit upon my life as I immerse myself in the voice of God and His Spirit fills me with the word of His grace. What if, what if I'm to leave my my reading of Scripture, not like a man who looks in a mirror and then turns away and forgets what he looks like, but as one who looks into the very face of God and is changed forever as a result. The Bible tells us that very thing. Look at the Scriptures, in the Scriptures, about the Scriptures, and you'll see that all of them are in the context of a changed life. Think about some of your favorite ones. 2 Timothy 3, all Scripture is God-breathed. Well, that's 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. But if your Bible is anything like my Bible, There are section headers 
And that verse falls within a section header that begins up at verse 10. And the section header in my Bible says that this is all about the way of life. Notice the verses in verses 10 through 13. You know my way of life. You know those who live godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution. There is a life to be lived. And Scripture, Scripture opens the gates for us to see the kind of people we're called to be as God by His power gives us what we need to become that. What about that passage in 1 Peter chapter 1? The, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. That's verses 23 through 25, but go all the way up to verse 13, and there's a header. And the header in my Bible is, be holy. It's in the context of the kind of people we're called to be, the kind of world God wants to see. We're called to be different. We're called to be changed. And Scripture is an opportunity to hear the Word of God and to walk away changed. Even Psalm 119, one of the most famous passages about the Word of the Lord, is about my walk of life as a result of reading God's Word. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Tomorrow, there are going to be many people looking up into the skies, but will you be looking forward to His return? Even today, there are many people who look into Scripture, but they look at Scripture, but they've yet to be transformed by the Spirit of God by looking through Scripture to the very face of God. What if we were to see the face of of God. What if today you were to hear his voice and you did not harden your heart? Would you answer the call? Would you grab hold of the free gift of grace that God wants to give you? Would you leave behind every sin that so easily besets? Would you, would you take hold of that for which Christ came running for you? Would you fall upon your face and receive the fresh wind of God's holy Spirit, I don't know what your particular calling this morning is, but you know it, don't you? You've been hearing that voice speak to you. You know that relationship that needs to be mended. You know that sin that needs to be confessed. You know that forgiveness that needs to be extended. You know that part of your life that you've been keeping secret from everyone that knows you and loves you but God knows you better than you know yourself. And he wants all of you. And this morning, you have the opportunity to give your whole self to the God who gave his own self for you. Listen to the words of our brother Paul. Since we have such hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Thank you for joining us. I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've been enriched. And if you have any questions, any thoughts, any comments, reach out to us at prayers at wschurch.net. God bless you. Tune in next week.